Hello everybody, welcome to Third Style Garage. My name is Doug. This channel is about the restoration of a 66 Mustang convertible named Vin. Also have a 66 Beetle project going on. Love it if you enjoy these videos. Uh, if you have suggestions, comments, questions, post them below. Would love it if you'd subscribe. Um, today's project, I'm on my last step on the underside of the 66 convertible. Uh, they came decently strong from the factory, but before I put it back together and paint it, I want to stiffen it up and strengthen it as much as I can. Stay tuned to find out how I did it in an affordable and custom way. So I've got my Mustang on a tip over jig, uh, which is nice. It gives me access to the bottom of it. Um, convertibles classically have a couple of challenges. I'm not a chassis expert. I am not by any means the end authority and all of this, just a normal Joe Schmo guy trying to make his car better, stronger, ride a little bit more modern, safe when he drives it. Um, and doing my best to do this on a budget so that when I'm done, I can afford to finish it and enjoy it. Uh, but I don't want to look back and regret steps that I didn't take along the way to make the car a little bit better. Uh, so originally when Ford made this car, they made it as affordably as they could, hence the unibody and construction. You've got a rear frame rail section and you've got a front frame rail section. It's not a full frame that the body sits on like some of the competitive cars were. Uh, it was a mass-produced car. I'm sure that they had no cares of the fact that 60 years later, I'd be working on restoring this, trying to make it better than what they did with technology and, and skills and ability and resources available they didn't have. From what I understand, some of the, the classic challenges with convertibles is sag in the frame door gaps don't line up tops on tops off adjust the rigidity of it uh, if you think of the top of a sedan you have that three-dimensional shape of the roof which adds a lot of structural rigidity by the um, the way it's connected by the pillars convertibles don't have that so how did they compensate for that they added an inner rocker to it uh, which so you've got your outer rocker you've got a middle kind of panel or beam and then convertibles added a third panel which strengthened this beam that went across um, I don't know if this was aftermarket or stock but there's a lower seat pan in addition to the upper seat pan that is there um, and then I took mine had to do some repairs um, welded up a lot of the seams just to make it a little bit stronger these two pans are connected by a plate here which kind of in effect makes this a beam going across uh, to strengthen it as well um, in a previous episode I talked about a few things that I've done on the front to strengthen up the engine compartment with the Monte Carlo bar and a one-piece export brace the shock tower braces and some gussets that I placed right here in front of the torque box. Um, most of my sheet metal is fairly new, the rockers, seat panels, stuff like that. So I feel like it's it's in good shape. So what, what else do I wanna do? Um, torsional rigidity is important as well as kind of the strength of the car from front to back. So. You're going down the road, the car sits over time with the convertible top off, uh, doors open or whatever, does it sag. Um, torsional rigidity is hard to do. If you think of an extension ladder extended out straight, it's pretty easy to twist that ladder. It takes a lot of bracing to, uh, to stop that from happening. I'm less concerned about that. It's not gonna be a race car that I'm taking hard corners on. Uh, but I do want to strengthen it while I'm here. So what I want to do is install or create my own subframe connector to connect the rear frame to the front frame. I then want to, uh, it will go through the floor pan here, uh, connecting that all to it as well. And then in the back here, it will tie in with the rear frame. 
I'm gonna do that out of some two by two by eight inch wall tubing and some two inch by eight inch steel plate. Um, show you how I'm doing it. So here's my two by two tubing laid out. Just got it setting on some saw horses. Two pieces, four feet long, eighth inch wall. The rough dimensions and plan that I'm getting are coming from a website called dayscars.com. If you just Google that and uh, look for the Mustang subframe connectors, you'll find these drawings. Basically the two by two tubing will have one, two, three, four joints in it. Two of them at 170 degrees and two of them at 174, which will give it a three dimensional shape. And this website does have a good description about um, how to make the cuts. Basically, you cut three of the walls, cut a small wedge out, then collapse it and re-weld it back together. My plan and hope is to get the sub connector frames to tie in as, as strongly as I can, obviously in the front and back, but then to hug the bottom of the floor uh, as, as closely as possible. I was worried about uh, losing clearance on the ground, um, particularly because I live on a city street where there's a large drop at the end of my driveway and I wanna be able to get in and out of my driveway. So what I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make all of the cuts, I'm gonna dry fit everything before I finally weld the subframe connector in so I can try to get it to sit as flush as I can. Then I'd also like to try to get it to tie in at this point to the floor pan, the rear seat pan, and uh, the upper seat pan that the seats sit on. Um, hopefully tying all that together. I won't do that on the tip up jig like this because I can't be certain that things aren't flexing with it sitting on its side. I doubt it is, it's not that heavy, but um, I think before I do final installation, I will roll the car back down and work underneath it uh, for final welding. That is the plan. So I'm gonna be working on uh, laying out and scribing the lines I need to cut on the steel. Uh, first, I'm gonna use my angle grinder with a uh, flat disc just to clean it up. Um, half so I can scribe clean marks on it with my scribing tool and my square. Partially because I'll need to paint it someday and I want to get rid of the rust that's on it and partly because I just love how nice raw clean steel works, looks and uh, that will give me a nice blank slate to work on. So I'm going to start cleaning this up and then I'm going to work on starting to lay it out. Alright, start out our first cut or bend is six and a half inches from the end. So I've got a T square um, set six and a half inches. Um, then before you start measuring, um, when you're grinding, you need to make a sacrifice to the god of knuckles because um, things are guaranteed to go better after that. So I'm basically oh, the other thing that I did was uh, when I was cleaning this up, I went back and forth this way, which put all of my scratches this direction on the pipe, um, which makes it almost impossible now to see lines that I scribe. So uh, I went back and kind of touched it up a little bit. Um, right here, hopefully you can see that so I can see my scribed line. So I'm just gonna take this. This is my marking scribe. It's a piece of hard and tip, sharp and tip on it. I'm um, just gonna put a mark at six and a half inches. Roll the pipe on all four sides. I guess it's not a pipe, it's tubing. Um, and then what I will do is I'll cut the pipe, the tubing open, but only on three of the sides so that um, the fourth leg becomes kind of the hinge that you use to close it up. Um, the website tells you that the gap um, 
the widest part of the wedge that you're removing needs to be a quarter inch. So you're removing a quarter inch of material. So I'm gonna set my square an eighth over. I'm gonna scribe another line. And then I'm gonna set it an eighth short. So the first one was six and five eighths. Now I'm at six and three eighths. Take the square part off. Roll this on its side. I don't know if you're looking at the top of my head or not. Um, and basically line up the edges. And this gives me the wedge that I need to cut out. Um, there are a variety of ways that you can cut this. Um, I'm gonna use my abrasive cutoff saw. You could do it with a cutting disc on an angle grinder. You could use a, if you've got a bandsaw, um, a variety of different ways. Let me show you what I did. So hopefully you can see this. Here's my, uh, this will be the edge that I don't cut. 180 degrees off of that, I measured a quarter inch gap um, off of my center there. Maybe you can see it there in the reflection. And then on the sides, you just connect it. This gives you the wedge that you need to cut on both sides. And then simply, if you, if you cut that gap well, you, you, when you close that together, that'll give you the, the, I think it was the 174 degree bend for, so I will have two 174 degree bends. I have two 170 degree bends. For the 170, um, instead of a, there it is, um, instead of that gap being a quarter inch of material that you need to remove, it's basically three eighths of an inch. Um, now for welding that back together strong, I want to cut away a little extra material. So I'm gonna take my abrasive saw, I'm gonna cut all the way down. I don't wanna cut through this wall, so do not leave, do not cut through that. But I wanna bevel this nicely and leave a small gap so that I can get really good strong weld penetration on that. So I've got one marked. Uh, I'm gonna carefully lay out the second one and then uh, the other three as well. I don't think you need to watch that. The key though is that the these things are mirror images of each other. So uh, there's those four bends in it. Don't mess up and make two du duplicate ones or you'll have to buy a whole nother car and still make another subframe and to use that on the other side. So uh, just take your time and do it well. So here you can see my cut uh, did not go through the bottom wall. Um, this does not need to be this precise, but in case you're wondering, um, you know, my abrasive cutoff wheel is measuring about a uh, hundred and eighty thousandths and I need to go to 250. So uh, I'm going to grind this opening a little bit wider here. Then when this gets bent up, I'll be able to weld that gap closed. Um, feel decent about this. Um, I wanted to get one done a little bit more closely to make sure I didn't have any huge surprises. So now I'm going to work on laying out the other seven cuts and bends, making sure I get them in the right uh, orientation. All eight cuts are made. Two, four, six, eight. 
Um, and then I ground the gap open. So this is my quarter inch gap. This is my three eighths gap. Um, symmetrical down the line. I wrote, no, don't cut here, just for me to remember. Um, paranoid, I'm gonna make a mistake. This is not that expensive. I've got about 75, I've got $75 into the two pieces of tubing and the piece of eighth inch plate over there. Um, so now that I have all these gaps ground, oh, I ground them open with my, uh, an abrasive cutoff wheel on my angle grinder. Do it in a safe way. Um, however you decide to do it on your own. Um, this worked out well for me. I ground it carefully, but uh, angle grinders with uh, grinding discs can be dangerous if used improperly. So be safe, use proper ear, eye protection, and uh, you're responsible for what you do, just like you're not responsible for what I do. All right, I'm gonna bend these up slightly so we can see the shape a bit. That was my son helping me out. As you can see, we've got the bends tack welded in place, just enough to hold them for now. I don't want to weld them permanently yet because I want to make sure they fit the car. Um, I set the angle with um, this little angle finder that I have. It's similar to a T-square, um, except you can set the degree to whatever you want. Uh, that should hopefully get me close. Um, and then if we hold this up, haven't done this yet, we'll see how well it works in theory. This fits in approximately like that. That box is going to have to get modified to fit it. This screw is also going to have to get shortened. Here I... Clamped a couple little one by ones in place just to mock it up and see how it looks. You know, I think that could look pretty sharp. Continues the flow of the frame. Uh, you have to imagine that it is two inches further this way. So this gap goes away. It tucks pretty nicely along the bottom of the pan. And then you can see I traced a black line there and a black line there. And I will remove this part of the pan so it sits flush to the floorboard here. 
and then this leg of it will fit inside that channel and get plug weld on three sides. I think I need to add plates on each side because uh, this channel is wider than the thickness, than the two inch thickness here. Then hopefully this whole thing will nest nicely and tuck against the bottom of the body and not hang down any lower than what exhaust will. Uh, imagine beautiful set of dual exhaust right there and there. Um, once I, I'm gonna work on cutting this out next. Once that is out, I'll work on fitting it. Once it fits really well and I'm happy with it, I will take it back out and uh, solidly weld it all together, blend the welds. Um, I will need to paint behind this here and the top of this because I won't be able to access that again later. And I'm gonna toy around with whether I need to mount anything to here. I'm thinking not because the subframe will be welded closely to uh, this lower seat pan brace. All right, I'm gonna work on uh, cutting that out. Obviously doing cuts like this, you want hearing protection, eye protection, uh, gloves if you want to. Uh, I'll be honest, I'm a little nervous cutting this out. I hope I'm doing this right. Worst case, I'm gonna have to cut it all out and buy new pans and start over, I don't think so. I wanna make sure that my slot that I cut isn't thicker than two inches uh, or I'll have too large of a gap to weld shut. So I'm going to be a little careful. I can always come in and grind it wider if I need to. So I'm going to cut on the inside of the lines just a little bit. Now what's going to be a challenge for me, I need to open that up to fit the 2x2 two two tubing into there. In essence, if this pan weren't here, I would have need to have cut that cap off. I got to figure that out yet. Here's what I'm running into. I don't know how to get that piece out. Uh, I know I'm gonna have to widen this because the piece of, first of all, this isn't two inches. And the piece of two inch tubing that's gonna go into here will have an eighth inch plate on each side to fill this gap, which means this needs to be two and a quarter. So I'll have at least an eighth inch gap on each side to weld shut, which is fine, I can do that. I'm not sure how to get in there and cut that out yet. Um, and I guess what I want to point out is this is the point in many jobs when when you hit that point where you're like, I don't know how to do this. Don't panic. It's okay. It's okay to not know how to do things. What I'm going to do is I'm going to walk over, grab my trusty old ugly stool, walk back. I'm just gonna sit and think for a while. I'm sure between the cutting disc, the sawzall, um, other things that I have, there's gotta be a way to make that happen. So I just gotta figure it out. Give me a little while. I'll show you what I did. Hello friends, that video is getting a bit long on these, the build of these subframes. So I'm gonna cut this episode right here 
um, and then uh, upload a part two. So if you want to follow the story, if you want to learn how to make your own subframes affordably, um, go ahead and click on part two in this series and you will see how it wrapped up. Um, I'm feeling really good about it. Thanks.